Access All Areas, episode 185, the podcast that aims to dive deep into all things great about this rock band in excess, get them in the Rock Hall of Fame, doing it with a bunch of listeners and patrons around the globe, but most importantly, doing it with my best friend and colleague in hand. B, how are you? I'm really well, thank you. I'm buzzing like a bee because today is the day we can say we've done it four years of podcasting together. We lasted four years and we hope we've got just as many to go, albeit we might need an in excess triple album release to extend ourselves out a bit, B. But yeah, we are four today. Just a quick shout out also to happy birthday to Mark Opitz, who uh, is having a birthday. But it's our birthday today, so we'll celebrate us. Welcome to the strange. Now, B, we are very, 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 very excited to have a special feature guest today that is all the way from America, who was the inspiration behind uh, my little sort of bubble head going, I think I might better do a podcast if this gentleman is able to do it. Came up with the idea of doing a podcast, asked you to join me on our little crusade, and uh, four years to us is a, is a pretty motivating achievement, isn't it? Absolutely. And he's such an inspiration. I do stress to everybody, check him out as well. He's from The Hustle, isn't he, Hayden? Absolutely, absolutely. So this is what we will call a feature episode. Uh, so we are not going to waffle on today. There won't be a news section or a traditional section. It's going to be all about the guest. And so without further ado, we're going to go straight into our feature interview. Uh, we're going to welcome uh, all the way uh, from America, John Lamro from the Hustle Podcast. Hello, John. How are you? Hi, guys. Thank you for having me on here. B, hello. And how, how are you all the way from Coffs Harbour? I'm good, thank you, Hayden. Thank you for uh, hosting this today. That's awesome. Yeah, we can't, <laughs> and it's good we can't to see you, John. You too, yeah. finally. We can't help but mention, B, you've come to the podcast with a set of uh, glasses here that have some sort of like Clark Kent superpower, fearless fly thing going on. I mean, it's not a great radio gag, but uh, you've just come up with some technology that I think John and myself have just been blown with. Can you just share with the listeners what you've got there? Yeah, I've got something called smart glasses, which is the new technology that's coming out for everybody. You can get it in your high street. Not only am I able to hear in stereo, not in my ears, but in my head, the sound by bone conduction, but you can also hear me crystal clear too, can't you, with these glasses? That's yeah. amazing, B, because I use, as you guys can see, a headset. It's a Jabra yes. headset that my work provides for me. And I think it sounds fine. I hope it does anyway. But you have everything I have in this headset with headphones and, and a mic coming out on your glasses that just look like regular glasses. I might have yeah, to give me yeah. a pair of these. <laughs> yeah, so you can you can get a pair of Blues Brothers Wayfarers, you know, the iconic yeah. um, risky business. Um, yeah. I've gone for ones that are a little bit rounder. Yeah, they actually turn into sunglasses when I go outside as well. So I can go to concerts and I can live stream with these direct to Facebook. So I'm going to be doing that when I go to England. So I can't wait to be showing some crazy things. I know I'm really excited to try them out, oh, actually. Very cool. Mm-hmm. We, might have to, we might have to post them as an attachment to this podcast or on our socials and give it a real thorough breakdown. But I did want to sort of, I guess, do a bit of a shout out. We probably have two sort of audiences today. Uh, we're going to have John's audience because this podcast will probably be streamed out to his audience. And we have our own, which is obviously an NXS dedicated sort of uh, audience as well. But uh, for those who, who have listened to our podcast for what is, uh, I think, a 185 episodes, and we feel like we've uh, travailed, which is, I think, it's our fourth anniversary this week, isn't it? Is that right? It is. Four years <laughs> that we've been getting it. Chatting and chatting about it. Yeah. 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 No one knows. Yeah. No one loves navel gazing as much as us. But I'm going to tip you <laughs> in here because I'm chatting to John, who I'm doing some calculations. He's uh, up to 469, maybe 470 in the what? bank in episodes. We're recording oh, this on John. I know we're recording this on May 4th. May 5th is our ninth birthday. So oh, yeah. Um, yeah, tomorrow wow. is officially the. That was the day our very first episode came out nine years ago. We always know it's tied into a, a mutual guest. We had, we had Mark Opitz on a number of times, which you have as well, and it's his birthday this week as well. So we always know our anniversary because it's his birthday. And birthday. And we know it's yeah. ours because it's your birthday. So breaking down, I mean, I'm doing some rough calculations. That must be nearly a decade, maybe a fraction shorter, a fraction over. You are roughly one episode a week, I think, aren't you? Yeah, we've been doing one a week. We've missed, I think, two weeks in all of these nine years. But a lot of the time we end up putting out bonus episodes on the weekends too. I'm in a very fortunate position where i have a production partner my friend yan does all of the production and so i always hear that's the worst part of podcasting is having to actually put the episodes together at the end so i just go out create whatever content i think is interesting we invite back former guests sometimes to deep dive albums they've worked on we'll have them on like andrew ferris came on a second time to promote we call them promo modes uh his new country album we'll have people will always pitch me books or authors and sometimes those interest me and i think well we'll i'll read their book and then talk to them about that and then i just 
pour it all onto Yan's plate. He gets it out whenever he can. Is Yan retired? Tell me, no. Yan retired. No. <laughs> <laughs> My God, it's very work. And I know. Like, what a man. I know. I know. Kudos to you, Yan. <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds like you've formatted and I've adopted your format where I do all the waffling and I just handle it to be and she does all the production tricks and things like that. We're very blessed to have people like you in our lives, B. I always think of it as I'm the Fresh Prince and he's DJ Jazzy Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to sort of acknowledge, I think you've up to set 469, 470 episodes. During COVID, you know, the inspiration for doing this uh, podcast for ourselves uh, here in Australia with B. Uh, was very much directly linked to yourself, linked to the rock solid guys and a couple of others within that sort of realm that, you know, listening to to people, you know, deep dive and have a longer form narrative with guests was something that as in modern day media where everything's clickbait and snap, uh, snappy chats and bite-sized chunks, there's an audience out there who do want to just sit back and, and maybe delve into a subject for an hour and stuff. Um, how did you find that work for you? I mean, I think a lot of people who start podcasts might say this, that they weren't hearing the kind of conversation they wanted to have or hear. So they start their own podcast and try to create that. That's what I did. And originally, um, you and I were talking about this a minute ago, Hayden. The original concept of the podcast was was to talk to bands who had the opportunity to break big. Maybe they put out one or two albums on a major label. Maybe they had a hit. Maybe they performed on a talk show. Maybe they opened for somebody. But they were in swimming in the waters of major label major label music business. And for whatever reason, it just didn't work out. And when you talk to most artists who go on podcasts are going on there obviously to promote something and that's great but my mind always goes to you know you haven't done anything in 30 years what have you been doing that's the part that interests me how do you pay your bills did you have to get a regular job do you make money off of touring and getting your song placed in movies or something how did it feel when you woke up the day after you realized you weren't going to make it as a rock star anymore and you had to go get a regular job I just find that those kinds of questions more interesting. Thankfully, we've, beca- we've been very successful and we've been going for a long time. And so now I talk to bigger artists where that's not necessarily always the arc of their career. I still you know, want to know the business side of things whenever I can. Who was your first? The very, so <laughs> in the middle of March of 19 or 2015, I couldn't sleep. I'd had the idea for the podcast for a while. It was like one or two in the morning and I got on the, on Facebook and I emailed, I messaged nine bands that I would want to talk to. And the next morning when I woke up, four of them had replied and said, yes, one of them said no. And the other four never answered. And so the ones who said yes were a Canadian band called Toronto. One was a really good, uh, kind of a more indie band here in America called shoes. There was this lady named Marge Raymond, who was one of the inspirations for the podcast. She in the 70s, had sang with this band called Flame. They were signed to RCA, produced by Jimmy Iovine. Nothing ever happened. So I just started talking to these people. Luckily, they said yes. Honestly, and this will appeal to your crowd, when Brian Canham of Pseudo, Pseudo Echo agreed to come on our show, who I think was our ninth guest or something like that, that was huge for me. I remember just feeling like I was floating for hours afterwards. He, they were big for me. I loved them. And mm. hadn't heard from him in decades. Where did mm. you go? Your music changed. What have you been doing? What's going on? You know, and the fact that he talked to me was huge. And from then on, it kind of grew. I was able to get bigger people. And so the very first episode we ever put out was with a guy named Bruce Blackman, and who was the um, lead singer of a band called Starbuck. They had a song called Moonlight Feels Right in the 70s, and it was a big hit. And that's it. And he pretty much lived off that song forever still does still living your energy as well sorry Hayden. i'm living your energy as well so i can see how that revolves sorry go go I mean, i'm just like you guys i i music is like my religion practically now i'm like friendly with some of the people who i grew up just idolizing it is unreal to me sorry Hayden. go ahead that's all right now look for our listeners that we've always encouraged to, to, to listen to your podcast a number of times you coined a, a phrase that i i found uh, a, a really polite way of, of extracting information. He uses this expression called ma- mailbox money, uh-huh. um, which which for someone like Ray Parker Jr., maybe he needed a few mailboxes because you spoke to him. We all know what Ghostbusters did for him, and the legend has it. That's made him hundreds of millions of dollars. And yep. for those who don't know, maybe it was a bit of a ripoff of a Huey Lewis and the News song, and 
he may be paid in the equivalent of a you know like, like the social network a parking ticket a, a small payout to Huey but you're right there are other artists who had songs that probably you know may have got licensed and and, and maybe they were able to make a, a living on it or they just had to have other jobs I mean you had a lot of you know not hard luck stories but just reality stories sure. of artists who, who ran concurrent careers yes which Peter Farnan who you, who you interviewed mm-hmm. recently in Boom Crash Opera you know is a university lecturer as well as plays in the band and mm-hmm. he, he juggles the two yeah and there's quite a few who do stuff like that. Um, one of my favorite stories relating to what you just said, and I, I will say it wasn't the most interesting interview I'd ever done, but I think it's a really interesting story. Kimberly Rue was a member of the Soft Boys. He's, it's a male, and his name is Kimberly. And then he went on to start Katrina and the Waves. And he wrote Walking on Sunshine, which to this day is just ubiquitous. It's all over the place. It was, yeah. you know, it was a, it was a pretty big hit back in the day. They're yeah. one and only. Yeah. And he wrote that song. And, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, BMG bought Katrina and the Waves catalog off of him for 10 million pounds. And I'm sure it's so that they don't have to pay him every time someone wants to license that song. So we'll just give the guy who wrote it 10 million pounds and he can go live his life for the, you know, the rest of the time and we can do whatever we want with that song. And I just think, yeah, I, I mean, it's basically like when it... Jingle yep. press supermarket chain. Oh, all the time. Yes, it's in every, you know, it's in every movie trailer and all this stuff. Yeah. I also had yeah. the guy, this guy, Frankie Previtt, who wrote I've Had the Time of My Life and Hungry Eyes from the Dirty Dancing soundtrack. And no disrespect for him, he's basically this meathead from New Jersey, you know? He was in like an AOR rock band called Frankie and the Knockouts. And his friend asked him if he would write a couple of songs for a movie called Dirty Dancing, which he thought might be pornography. And he wrote these songs. And they got turned into these hits that are, I think I've had the time of my life. It's like the 25th most played song in the history of songs or something. Yeah. And he literally couldn't be a more yeah. regular dude from Jersey, <laughs> but it's basically like winning the lottery. You don't know. But isn't that a great story as well? Yeah. That regular guy, like, you know, not have been in the industry that long or, you know, haven't made it that um, had make one song and then hit it. Oh God. Tote for us all yet. Hey. I <laughs> <laughs> One of these days, someone's going to going to discover us, and we're going to be like <laughs> the million dollar podcasters or whatever. You did you see those young ladies on um, Australian TV the other day, Hayden? And they've they're, they're now filling stadiums. They're podcasters, and they're filling stadiums. Really? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, no. you have to get your yeah. They have to get your niche market. They're they're all from England, so I reckon that you know we might start off in little pubs and clubs like our bands. What do you reckon? <laughs> well, well, look how people consume media, you know, has changed. I mean, we all we all consume me- media, but it's all it's, it's all about distribution. And you know, we we all grew up in an era where we had uh, a thing called a a Walkman. We put a tape into it, and we put our batteries, and we were consuming media that way. And and obviously, we still consume media, but it's just done in different ways and different sort of formats. And podcasts too, the convenience of information, the convenience of different topics that are of your appeal, having platforms like Spotify and Podbean that we all use. To help disseminate it out to the audiences is probably sort of how you know these things are growing and growing and growing um and, and the social like, aspect as well the social yeah. one of yeah. the things that uh, you know i spoke to to john about before coming on that i wanted to hit upon and a great advocate of australian music and obviously uh, you know 50 percent of our audience are probably a local to here and 50 percent internationally but john's given his podcast as a platform to certain artists that have had international success uh, some's been just more domestic success here but he just loved them and maybe they toured a little bit or he knew of them uh, I know John spent, I think it was uh, 1992, living in England, and probably you may have had some Australian bands consume the media zeitgeist from there that weren't big in America. But John's always been quite a student of music around the globe. And just a bit of a list uh, that of Aussie sort of linked artists that he's spoken to in his podcast. Uh, Ivor Davies, he's had I think on twice, John, yep. from Ice House. And, and a great guest, I think a very giving guest, you know. Um, he is. He's a great storyteller. He's very yeah. smooth and classy. I was lucky that he gave me his time a couple of times. Yeah. Like he, him and, you know, some of the stories about him and Jim Kerr, who went way back from Simple Minds. Um, you know, he, he was just one of those guests who really wanted to be there and, and gave it all. Dave Faulkner from the Hoodoo Gurus, the lead singer. Um, Peter Farn, I mentioned recently, sort of the founder of Bull Crash Opera. Andrew Farris, you've had on twice, I think, haven't you? I think. Yeah. Dave Faulkner um, was on twice too, actually. Okay. Paul Kelly, who was a great episode, who's our version of Bob Dylan, who you've seen, I think, play live in your region. A guy called Jeff Apter, who was really the uh, the author of a, a, a Neil Finn book called Don't Trim It Over, uh, which was a, a fairly recent episode. It was great. Tim Finn, uh, Neil's yes. brother. 
Uh, Very jealous uh, about that uh, one. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was huge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm going to throw a, a little bit of a self-indulgent one here. Andrew Roachford, uh, this is a guy from your neck of the woods, uh, from England, B, who had a big hit called Cuddly Toy, but he had a big album called Permanent Shade of Blue. But um, his song, This Generation, is the song that my company is called in 1996 when it got incorporated. Really? Yeah, yeah. so my company, no so the story is called This Generation. And I met Andrew at a gig in Melbourne. I gave him a business card after the concert. And he looked at me and he looked at the card. He looked up at me and he goes, get the fuck out of here. So you can tell your father. Graham Goble from uh, Little River Band. Now, he's a very confident self guy isn't he, uh, Graham? A song yes. That wrote a lot of the hits for Little River Band. Yes. He was actually, I thought he was a really sweet man. And there's, a, there's yeah. some drama there with, you know, who's out there calling themselves Little River Band. Yes. This happens a lot. Um, but he's, like you said, confident in the fact that I wrote those songs. I'm responsible for the sound, and those guys aren't aren't doing it right. You know. Now, a side note: you're obviously, you're aware of John Farnham here in Australia. I became the lead singer there. Uh, there's a great documentary on John Farnham in Australia that's called The Voice. You might get it on some of the streaming platforms or whatever there. But there's a good anecdote with Graham Goble, who uh, was asked the question in the doco: Is it true that you uh, put gaffer tape around uh, John's microphone to restrict him from moving around the stage as much? Okay. Graham said in reply to that question, he said, look, I don't remember doing it, but it sounds like something I would do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've had an honorary Australian, Leo Sayer, has a bit of a link with Ray Parker. Go check that episode out. So I bet Leo Sayer was a bit of a live wire. He's, he's great. He's, he's great. great. Uh, he's so and, full of uh, stories. Yeah, he's so grateful for his career. And so he just talks and he's a, he's great at it. Sweet yeah. man. Yeah, he's good. Yeah. Very nice. Obviously, the Kawhi Boys, lead singer, Mark Abel, the Sudoeco you mentioned. Uh, just a couple of crossover ones for our audience. Uh, you had Sean Dixon from the Super Dragons on, who, who who we had on our show, which was which was a great one to be hosted. Uh, Nick Lornay, uh, you've had on, who we've had. Uh, obviously, Andrew Farris. Mark Opitz, obviously, we mentioned earlier. Two that I'd love to have on our podcast. One that could relate to in excess, one that can't, um, was David Wilde. He's great at it. He would probably talk to you in a minute. What's the link with David Wilde? David Wilde's sort of a, a heavyweight of Rolling Stone for a long time. I, I'll let John maybe give his bio. Yeah, he has a, he's more of a behind-the-scenes music writer. Um, he oh. hosts now a very popular podcast with Phil Rosenthal, the guy who created Everybody Loves Raymond called Naked Lunch. He writes a lot of like the Grammys or the Oscars or, you know, he's a behind-the-scene guy and thankfully is a, is a listener of our show. And he contacted me a few years ago because this tribute to Prince was coming out on CBS or something that he had a hand in writing and creating. And he said, look, I love your show. Bring me on and I'll tell stories and we can, and I can promote this, the Prince thing. And I was like, great. So, wow. um, <laughs> yeah, so he did. And we keep in touch a little bit. He's a really, really nice guy. All right. Well, line please hand he, yeah, please hand yeah. his uh, information. <laughs> I will. Line of notes. Was it on Bowie or one of the albums? I think you talked about it. Wow. Yeah. I I, there's a lot of them. I think I'm pretty sure he did the liner notes, a little bit of trivia to the best of both worlds, two disc, best of Van Halen CD. And if I remember wow. correctly, he wasn't allowed to mention David Lee Roth's name. So it had to be like the original singer did this, but now <laughs> Sammy Hagar is doing this. And so, anyway. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> They're politics. They're uh -huh. politics. Yeah. You could, do a, you could do a podcast series on Sam versus Dave, couldn't you? <laughs> you know? I have another episode coming up in the next week or two uh, with a guy who wrote a book on David Lee Roth. And so right. we re we have a whole conversation about him and what a weird dude he is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and look, I love the episode um, you had with Holly Knight, who I just thought was mm -hmm. great as a great, great sort of lyricist and songwriter and things as well. But uh, the the powerful link, you know, that probably aligns some of your guests that you've had and some of the things you spoke about, to, as I said, to Peter Farner recently about was uh, just this, this notion of live music and the DNA within Australia where our lineage came from, the bands that came out of here and you know, we've had some guests on like Michael Browning, who really was a, was the first manager of ACDC, and he really signed them up, made them what they were, all the way up to Highway to Hell, and he got the boot just before Back in Black. He's the same guy that, after coming back from, you know, that experience with ACDC, signed up in excess to Deluxe Records and managed them for the first two years. He then went on to, you know, sell that off to Chris Murphy, and then he went on and discovered Noise Works with John Stevens, who ironically became the lead singer of in excess. So... Yep. So Michael's been an interesting guy, and he, he talked a lot about the stuff in the 60s and sort of the bands around here at the time, and it's back in that era, a lot of these bands started off playing dancers, you know, uh, particularly the UK, they called them dancers and things like that for our older generation of listeners. Fast forward to the 70s, you know, we had sort of bands that came out of Australia, particularly sort of in the mid-70s, uh, like Chain and, uh, you know, Cold Chisel started to emerge, and then we had the Angels, 
uh, that um, Mark was first, you know, I guess uh, involved with sort of producing. You know, in excess, which is really our feature, sort of a commonality of our podcasts, you know, followed in those sort of footsteps. And you said something uh, to Peter recently about just this DNA of true grit when it comes to sort of playing live and winning an audience over. Is that something you've seen with now, Australian music, being, I guess, a, a fan over the journey and things? Yes, definitely. I have been trying for years to put my finger on what it is that makes these Australian or New Zealand, you know, Zealand specific bands have that grittiness to them. I've never been able to figure out exactly where that came from. Why does Midnight Oil and In Excess and Hunters and Collectors and the Huda Gurus or whatever, why did their version of rock and pop sound different than America's version or even the UK's version? And I've never been able to figure that out until I was talking to Peter and he was talking about the pub culture of the 70s and 80s and 90s over there that that's where bands learn to play. And it was a combination of a couple of different conversations. One, when Mark Seymour from Hunters and Collectors was on a couple of years ago, I love their, their live album, Under One Roof. And I remember one of the songs in there, I can't remember which one now off the top of my head, he mentions in like the crowd banter or something about, is it the Gucci Hotel or something like yeah. that? Yeah. It's Gucci. Pretty- okay. Gucci. So- Yes. And yeah. so I, whenever it sounds so exotic, everything in Australia sounds exotic, by the way, <laughs> it's just all these weird words. And, uh, and I'm thinking cra- this crowd sounds huge. The music sounds huge. How big is this hotel that it's how that it has the Coogee hotel or whatever, that's big enough to have a sound like this. So when Peter was talking about that pub culture or that hotel culture, or, you know, the club culture that those bands have to earn their stripes in. It all kind of came together. Peter would refer to like Midnight Oil's crowd as yabos. And you just imagine like tough guys who've been out like surfing all day or playing Australian football or whatever and tough and now they're in the pub or in the hotel or whatever it is and they're having drinks with their mates and they're drunk and they're rowdy and you have to be a good enough band that you capture their attention. And I finally realized that's where that grit comes from that not everyone has. And it's unique to Australia. You don't hear that in anyone else's music. Not really. Yeah, and still tight with their music as well Absolutely. as a band. Yes. So when they, they when they produce, they're together. They're not isolated and put together. It's tight and raw. Mm, that's it. Those are the and that's where they earn those stripes. Yeah. Who produced that and, to, and Collector's um, album that you just mentioned there? Because I must admit, I, I, I probably don't know. Do you that have it? <laughs> question yeah i'd like to know um, i'm sure it'd be an australian producer and if it's our mark opitz then yeah i don't that would think be it the is but let's see there's okay. they, their live album i think they may have produced it themselves to be honest wow you guys are just better at that than everyone else is you did a similar sort of list of bands and i think what happens in australia is and you, you probably found this in, in securing your guests is that we're a small industry, but everybody knows each other and works with each other. And the cluster and the camaraderie and the the sense of DNA of, of playing live is very, very live and present. If we flip to sort of 1986, around December, In Excess, along with their management, along with Jimmy Barnes, who was just having a surge in his solo career, he, he'd left Chisel three years earlier and had this massive surge. And we created a concert series down here called Australian Made. And it was a direct sort of middle finger up to the international acts because we'd had Die Straight play 20 concerts at, at our tennis centre. Uh, we'd had a whole bunch of other artists come down here over the prior few years. It was sort of in excess and Barnsley and, uh, you know, Mentals Anything. Div- and uh, Divinals. Divinals. And some of these other bands effectively saying to the promoters, you know, who were just prioritising international guests, well, we've got some great talent here. So they created a festival called Australian Made and you know, it's gone on DVD and it was across December, January of 2000, uh, sorry, of 1986 into 87. And that's the genesis of the song Good Times that you might probably know, John, that went, ended up in the uh, the Lost Boys soundtrack. Love that song, yes. That was a song that really was made for the tour and, uh, you know, I think top the charts in New Zealand and uh, number two in Australia, whatever at the time. But it was really sort of like to capture that spirit, you know, of Australian music and that live scene and, you know, with overseas acts. You guys just export that sound better than anyone else. We have a little bit of a spoiler alert. Jim Mogini from Midnight Oil is going to be our guest in a couple of weeks. He was great. I read his book, and his book was interesting, but I I was kind of craving some of the music stories, and a lot of it is just 
the layout or the terrain of Australia, it's a bunch of words that are hard to even pronounce. It feels like if if you could surf on Mars, that would be what Australia is all about. I imagine just like hot red rocks with oceans that you can surf into. Reading his book made that place feel even more exotic and like otherworldly than it already did. By the way, if Trump gets elected again, I'm telling my family we're going to move down there. With the company I work for, every four years, you get a paid sabbatical, a six-week sabbatical. And my I hit four years this week. And so later this summer, we were debating where to go on our sabbatical. And Australia was one of the places we were thinking about. We ended up, we're going to go to Scotland. But no, I've never been to Australia. I've always wanted to. I did go to New Zealand once. He died of COVID, unfortunately. But he was a flight attendant for United Airlines. And so growing up, whenever he would go somewhere, if I wanted to, I would just hop on the plane and go with him for a weekend. And wow, yeah, and he had a trip to New Zealand once, and so I went with him. I mean, this was 1998, probably, or something like that. We stayed the night and met some friends of friends and had a really great meal, and it was beautiful. And then we came home the next day, and that's it. But it was gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. I, lovely looking out of the airplane going over New Zealand, the yes. mountains, the river structures. It's beautiful. It's like watching a painting. Yeah. And it was December. And it was a week or two before Christmas, and we heard like a choral concert of, at a church, and it was so interesting. It was outdoors. It was so interesting to watch this choir sing Christmas songs with palm trees swaying in the background and like 80 degree weather, you know, because that's just not, wow. that's yeah. opposite to us. I'm saying wow, but yeah, I'm in <laughs> a Cubs Harbor. You've got to come here. It's very, uh, yeah, love to. tropical. It's very tropical. Right. Yes. But yeah, if you come over, Hayden, do you reckon we could uh, organize a bus trip for um, an inexpensive oh, bus probably. trip for <laughs> for John? <laughs> would, love would, there, would there be uh, yeah. plenty to see here? And your comparison of, of Mars is probably eighty percent of our desert land would mirror mirror, mirror well eighty percent of our country would mirror that description. The Oslo's uh, autobiography on In Excess, or biography on In Excess, uh -huh. um, which I guess uh, I think came out in 2005. And look, for the better part of their recording career and, and going backwards, probably covers uh, a fair bit of, of information. And you probably you probably know more than us because uh, I haven't read that for, for 15, 20 years myself. But it pretty fairly, I remember at the time reading, it was a pretty fair, comprehensive deep dive. And I guess it was commissioned by the band. He'd written uh, he'd written for other artists. I think he might have written for um, Chili Peppers and a couple other people and things. But... Um, what was your takeaway from that read uh, of that book? I I loved it. The thing, I love that it didn't pull, it, it was interesting to me that the book, your emotions while reading it mirror probably the trajectory of the band. I was afraid at first that it wasn't going to hit hard enough, that it wasn't going to touch on the dark side of all of this for an excess. But eventually they do, he covers it very respectfully. You know, when this, the career starts the downturn and People are getting divorced or having affairs. The drugs sound rampant. So I was so glad that he didn't pull any punches. Because as much as I love in excess, I'm not interested in reading a book that's too honorary or too respectful. Because there just mm -hmm. is too much. There's too much other stuff that kind of taints that picture. Like I remember him referring to Andrew Ferris and his the love of his life, wife or whoever, whatever her name was, and to realize most of these guys have been divorced again, and it didn't quite work out, and whatever. But Life goes on. Families are messy. And we've sort of adopted the same thing with this podcast. You know, I said to B at the outset, I don't want this to be a bit of a kumbaya love fest. I said, this is an anthology, yeah. and it's taken a while to get to where we got to, but it's 1977, and what is our cutoff point? Is it 2012, 14? We don't quite know yet. But we attack every subject literally with uh, with honesty and, and um, opinion and, and subjectivity. I'm and just, uh, you know, playing the company card, you know? Um, yes because we wanted to represent what it's aiming to represent, and that is fact. Yes. They're such a great band. You would love it if the road had been easier for all of them, but it just wasn't. And you just realize, it, from an outsider, for people like us, we think being the biggest band in the world sounds great. Isn't that what it's all about? Every band who's ever been there, it messed them up, you know, from Elvis to Michael Hutchins. And so yeah. there, it must just be a toxic environment that, uh, that eats you alive, but... To an outsider, it's like, how could that possibly be? It sounds wonderful, but the pressure is just too much. In terms of sort of the, the music side of things, you or our generation sort of, uh, you know, John, so tell us a bit about your trajectory with the band in terms of tracks or albums or parts of their career that resonated with you. 
I learned about them, it would have been around what you need. There was, in the UK, there was Smash Hits magazine. And I think in the US, it was might have been called Star Hits. I'm not sure. But anyway, and you, I wouldn't see it all the time. But once in a while, I'd see it in a gas station's newsstand or something like that. And I would buy it. And I remember there were pictures of Michael and the band. And I didn't know if it was Inks or how exactly you said the band's name. Yeah. Um, yeah. The video to The One Thing was one of the first videos I ever remember seeing, but it, I didn't hear anything after that. I didn't remember who, that's who the band was or anything. So once Once You Need comes out and Listen Like Thieves, which is still, I think, their strongest album, front to back, and then, of course, you know, Need You Tonight. And from then on, I'm I'm not just invested, but I'm I'm hooked. And so you go back and you buy all the old stuff. And I remember so well getting in my car one cold night in November of 97, I think it was, I turn on the car to go home. I'm still in, I'm in college and they play back to back in excess songs. And you think, Oh, this can't be good. Why are they yeah. playing two in excess songs back to back? And sure enough, then the DJ comes on and says, you know, we just found out that he, Michael Hutchins died. And I'm getting all goosebumpy right now. Even just thinking, I am too. Yeah. It was just, I'm, fathomable shocking I can't believe it it was just yeah. the, the fact that they'd probably just you know come out of um america on amazing tour yeah um like their trajectory of um going back into you know with their new album and everything and then bang it's just got so short or them finally in concert three oh. or four months before this oh is that really personal yes and they finally come through utah when i was there because i went to college in utah and you could tell that Michael just, he wasn't adjusting well, I don't think, to not playing the stadiums anymore, you know? He just seemed to kind of yeah. have other things on his mind. And while the book made it pretty clear that in that you 2 were heavily influenced by NXS originally, eventually with the Pop Mart and the Zuropa type stuff, NXS then sort of was being influenced by U2. And so about the time of Elegantly Wasted, the, I remember the, the set design felt very U2-ish, sort of futuristic and it just didn't feel like they were at the height anymore but it you hoped that they would get it back and the fact that it's so over and they're not one of those bands that can replace him they tried as you know with the tv show and john stevens and terrence trent darby and whatever you can't replace one of the three greatest front men of in history so you got to figure something else out i have to put my little words in there that you Please. said that you felt that in excess were sort of like on the coattails of um, you two in a way like with their set design and stuff but you know michael and um, bono were very close yes. and michael had a lot of ideas and i think they might have been probably stolen a little bit as well so right. who knows that they might have combined their ideas and that's how it how it expelled but i wouldn't say that in excess really were yeah, they were inspired by their musicianship, but I think there was probably ideas that they shared. Mm. You're right, B, and I'm glad probably, you clarified yeah. because the book mentions that too. The oh, pop does it? Stuff, oh. Yes. And so okay. I'm, I'm glad you clarified. I misspoke. You're right. It, it, you two was getting more of the credit. Dan dancey. Dancey yes. and funky. Yeah, they were. Because... When it was clearly in excess that was influencing them to go that direction. I used to sort of go back and chart this sort of particular period. If you went back to sort of 1987, you 2 were the biggest band in the world, you know, with the Joshua yeah. and everything around that. In 88, though, In Excess were the biggest band in the world with the MTV Awards and scooping the pool that were bigger than the Grammys in that era and they had more album sales and number one hits and top ten hits than the Joshua Tree did, which was with the Kick album. You know, you got to sort of... Uh, around 1989, 1990, and you had probably around 19, uh, 19, if I go back with, you had Bon Jovi broke in 89, well, 86, 87, but off the second, third album in 89 was huge, and, and then the Chili Peppers in 91 sort of had their, their time in the sun, and then, you know, you go to 92, 92 Nirvana, 93 Pearl Jam, 94 Soundgarden, 95, you know, Smashing Punk was like, everyone had this sort of moment trajectory with they at one point in time, yes. with the cultural zeitgeist of music, and the thing that I feel with the rock Hall of Fame doesn't quite get it, is there was no bigger band in the world than anyone in 88 than in excess because their back catalogue, John, albums like The Swing went platinum on the basis of, of Kick. The Swing stiffed in America, but on the basis of Kick, back catalogue suddenly got a regeneration. Yes. yes. People were like, oh, I might go check out The Swing album. I might go check out Shabu Shabar. 
interesting things, Bono and Michael around sort of 89, 90, who were quite pally, uh, you two toured in Melbourne and Sydney and that in 89, and my, there's photos of Michael in the change rooms with, uh, with Bono before the concert. But Bono's fear would be hanging out with Michael at a nightclub and never hearing a U2 song. He'd go, I'd hear in excess songs and remixes. He'd go, I'd go to these nightclubs with Michael, I'd hear all this stuff up, and I'd never hear a bloody U2 one. Where did it's, you a bit hard, it's a bit hard to, re, to, re, to remix right in the name of love. Yeah. Well, maybe, was, you know, or, you know, in God's country. You yes. know, they're not exactly prone to a bigger mix, Paul Oaken. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's you know, so true. Yeah. But, so you know, but when it came to 91 and, and you two had to sort of, you know, he, as he said, I think his last gig in, in 1989 in Dublin, he said, oh, we've got to go away and dream it all up again. Their shift from Christian sort of rootsy Americana sort of band to dance, irony, you know, hip, that was a big shift for them. I think in excess of yeah. slight problem with the careers, like they were actually a bit of a, they could do everything on the one album anyway. They could do dance, yes. they could do power pop, they could do funk, they could do uh, jangly, you know, guitar sound stuff. Their sound was so mixed up on every album. Their transition when they did go to other albums, maybe didn't quite get the industry yeah. read as as music development. Albeit, we think they developed on Welcome to Wherever You Are and Full Moon. But they were that adaptable on each album. Maybe their transition was more seamless and less obvious. You might be right. Maybe you guys, you tell me what you think. To me, they made a couple of critical mistakes at exactly the wrong time. Number one, X, which is a strong album, is kind of a lesser carbon copy of Kick, if you ask me. Yeah. It's two or three, R Suicide Blonde, Disappear, two or three, Bitter Tears is one of their great lost singles, if you ask me. And then there's a, kind of a lot of filler. But it wasn't necessarily the wrong album. It just wasn't a special album or something that kicked it up a notch even more. When Mel Welcome comes out, it's argu it's arguably a better album, but I've never understood. <laughs> sounds dumb. You have six of the best looking guys in the world in one band, and the cover of your album is three weird looking little kids. No offense, kids, if you're listening, but they're <laughs> just, and Mark Opitz felt strongly like their decision not to tour the States for that album. Did them in. Yeah. They decided at the wrong time to kind of yeah. downshift into coasting, and that was yeah. the exact moment they should have pounced even harder. Take it yeah, on risks, right. look different, whatever it might be, but they, they chose to play it safe instead of taking but it up a notch like you two did. Yeah, they'd done so much stadium work with the X yeah. album, hadn't they? Mm. Well, I think with X, I think with X, Michael said, you know, and this the thing called distance, you know, after the album's out, after you tour it, they're really, I mean, it sold over 10 million copies, but I think Michael just said, look, it was probably just a little bit polite. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, right? yep. And I thought that was an, an interesting description. It wasn't a bad album, but it was probably polite. And the world were waiting for Kick, and they got it, right? But a bit like Oasis with Be Here Now after uh, definitely, uh, you know, definitely maybe, the world were waiting for that. And he just sort of, again, consolidated and didn't do anything new on the next one, albeit seven-minute guitar solos, you know? <laughs> they were going to buy it anyway. With the X label, we're going to buy it anyway. But maybe they, if they had had Welcome come out, maybe, maybe the industry would have gone, wow, you've got to take this up a notch. And this would have been an interesting live show and whatever. Yeah. And, you, and Mark Opitz, friend of both our podcasts, said to them, I think X is a carbon copy. I said, I like Suicide Blonde. I like Disappear. I like those ones. But I want you to be more musical on this Welcome album. I want you to be, I want it more musical. I want you to really push yourself. And it really was a, a labor of love for, for Mark, John, sorry, Mark, uh, Andrew, and, and, and Michael, who predominantly worked on it. Mark Opitz said it's the best album he's ever made. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and he's without wrong. Of it. it deserved a better. I just think if you're, you know, a 20 something year old and you go into a record shop and you're looking at those three weird boys on a weird cover yeah. of an NXS album and you've just yeah. spent the last five or six years falling in love with these charismatic six men who are making yeah. incredible music, this yeah. connection well, in your yeah, brain yeah, between uh -huh. product and yeah. image, it might be too much. And us girls wanted the photos, even of if you get the gatefold full of, of them. <laughs> yeah. Sweet, sweet, sweet. sweet. You taste it. it sounds a bit weird too, but you know, you two predominantly in the marketplace are Bono and The Edge, right? Yeah. But Bono, as he's said lots of times over the years, he, he, if you think about his first half of his career, he was this sort of, you know, introspective, quiet, you know, moody, fantastic vocalist, rock guy. But he's almost called himself a travelling door-to-door salesman the last 25 years of his career, going from town to town, place to place. And Bono's always selling, as we all know, whether it's meeting Bishop Tutu, he's selling. <laughs> whether it's doing something with, uh, relevant to you know uh, an interview or whatever, he's always selling. And I think Michael, weirdly enough, was such a Michael was such a 
an outward flamboyant guy on stage, but relatively quiet and introspective yeah. off stage. Yeah. And he was very much about the democracy of the band, the six band members. But the irony, he probably didn't do as much press as he needed to do to really sell the band in America particularly. It was always Tim and Kirk out there doing a lot of the interviews. Now, ironically, Andrew and Michael didn't do enough probably press as the driving forces behind the band. And that's just a, a personal view I have. I think you might be right. In fact, I'm trying to find it now. The the name of Mark Opitz's book. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. Sophisticated Punk. Sophisto Punk. I knew it was something punk. Yeah. He yeah. references in there having a conversation with Michael before Michael has to, I think, either go on stage or do an interview. And Michael says, well, I guess it's time to put on the charisma coat. And I think about that line every day because it says to me a lot of Michael's relationship with his own rock star image and the responsibility he feels to sell the in excess door to door. I mean, he's, as we know, he was a very sensual guy that liked women, that liked food, that liked wine, that liked travel. He looked like a rock star all the time, and he had the charisma of one, but that wasn't necessarily who he wanted to be 24-7. He wanted the fruits of that life, but he didn't want to be on all the time. And so when Mark details him putting, saying, I got to put on the charisma coat, and you just think, I know, I know how tired I get if I'm in a social, if I'm at a party or something where I'm not interested in talking with anyone there and my social anxiety kicks in. We've all been there. You know what I mean? I don't know anyone here. I don't have anyone to talk to. I'm going to stand in the corner. And to think that I, he has to put on the coat that gives him the superpower to overcome those moments 24 seven, that's got to be exhausting. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And then, and for Andrew to have done that as well, there yeah. is even more injury. Yeah. Yes. So um, for both of them to do that, yeah, it would have been a bit of hard work to get them onto it. But yeah, I mean, I think when, when you you see Michael, he's always in there. He's also he's always respectful, isn't he? He's always polite, and you know, it's a, it, it's never an awkward um, conversation with Michael. He always looks like he's interested in the person that's interviewing him as well. We're yeah. fortunate to have uh, Gary Beers on the show uh, maybe this time a year ago, and. Um, one of them, he said, that sort of relates a little bit to Canada. Right? I think if you interviewed Bob Rock and other Canadian artists in the past, um, Australian artists, and particularly Canadian artists, I mean, they often when they travel, the tyranny of distance is difficult in their own country. And then you got added the tyranny of distance when they go overseas. And, you know, a lot of the uh, production people that InXS would use in Europe and America were the same people that you too would use. But the difference being that InXS would probably have to pay off the debt for the two after about 50% of gigs. Whereas a lot of the U2s of the world would often, you know, be in the black, you know, within the second or third gig based on just, just production costs and things and travel costs and stuff like that. But, you know, the bigger picture you you spoke to David Wald about that I think I remember correctly, and you spoke about, um, I think, David befriending Terence Trent Darby, who ironically was a bit of a link with NXS and things. You talked about NXS, and David said something. It's really interesting. NXS has got such a great back catalogue. Some bands have eight or ten songs. They've got like 20. They're surprising why they're not in the Hall of Fame. And I... I just think that's one of those uh, lost things. I mean, I reckon if you went down the street and said, name 10 Van Halen songs, 10 ACDC songs, most people who say they're ardent fans could name 10. I think it creates well, a too, and I, it's, it's, I think they could name yeah. 20, you know? Yeah. yeah. I, I just put a post out um, yesterday saying, what do you think is In Excess's signature song? Like, there's just too many to choose from. Like for me, I would I would say never tear us apart, maybe because it was just such an iconic video and song. But you know, some would say Suicide Blonde, What You Need. You probably say that. I mean, it's just like you say, the list is endless. B that now you've got me thinking. I think from an American perspective, it all began in earnest with Need You Tonight. That would probably be what we would say. I feel like Don't Change over the yeah. last. Since he died, that song has gotten just bigger and bigger every year, where it's I've almost eclipsing some of the other songs. I would almost say this currently they might don't change might be the one, you know? I would I would say that too. Um, like for you know, it's our intro that we play. Yeah. So for us well, it's forefront anyway. But that's yeah. the one that um all, all, all the uh, the peers played, John. Like uh, Springsteen played that live yes. in Sydney. Josh Hunt, Queens and the Stone Age, Stone Age recently posted on his YouTube uh, Instagram site. I think the Killers do a version yeah. of it or have played it live and stuff. Yeah. Green, Green Day do oh, it, cool. you know. Um, <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, so many so many people seem to, from the band side of things, look at that as a sort of a, a track. And 
I guess relating back to, to music as an overall thing, songs can have different shelf lives. They can reappear and regenerate their interest, can't they? Going back to the Hall of Fame idea, the problem is not necessarily with the Hall of Fame. The problem is, and it, this again is probably largely in America, I still worry, and you and I talked with Nick Bamback on his podcast run in retrospect on this topic in great detail, Hayden, but I feel like people just... Most common music lovers think of them as an 80s band, first and foremost, which is just rips my heart out. Because when I think of an 80s band, I think of a band that only really had hits or was anything in the 80s. And they are far from that. That period of the 80s. (laughs) Yes. Or their sound is so tied to the sound of the 80s that it's more nostalgic than it is timeless. And to me, in excess are about the most timeless band. I always say this. My listeners have heard me say it. Maybe yours has too. People act like the ability to mix rock and pop in a perfect four-minute song is easy. And it's not. And it seems easy to them because In Excess did it continuously oh, wow. over and over again. Yeah. That's the height of what we're trying to do here. They did it better than anyone. So the thing that you think is important enough, like, you know, New Sensation or Never Tear Us Apart. These are 80s songs. Listen Like Thieves. It's like, no, these guys were geniuses that they even came up with that in the first place. It lasted into the next decade, and those songs are still awesome. So you have to change the minds. Maybe they need the Queen Bohemian Rhapsody effect or something. I feel like Same. everyone loves yeah. Queen now, where Queen couldn't have gotten arrested too long, you know, much before no. that. And if they were big, but not to the level they are now. So something needs to happen to change everyone's opinion in the first place, and then maybe the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame will follow suit. I'll do a trade with you. You give me David Wilde, I'll give you Mark Pellington. Okay. Mm, third one. Uh, oh, Mark was a... Yeah. We, we had probably uh, one of our most illuminating interviews with Mark, and as you know, all the great videos he's produced over time, from Pearl Jam to Excess to, to uh, Peter Gabriel, but you know, one of the great movies that you probably remember, Arlington Road, um, mm-hmm. with Jeff Bridges... He was such a great guest. Halfway through our interview with him, he said, in excess, aren't in the Rock Hall of Fame. And he said it down the camera going, what? It, it then rings his man who works at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The producer <laughs> of the actual show. Of the show. And then he comes onto on the show. live. Really? And, and it's trying to yeah. explain how they're not in the Hall of Fame, that he's not part of the subject committee. And he, we had this running gag post that interview that Mark's going to be helping that lobby away. But... We know the entry level is politically charged. We know probably if Inexcess had USA passports, they probably would have got in. But you said something correct before. They probably need something to come out. Like uh, the Go-Go's had a documentary about five yes. years ago that mm-hmm. propelled them back in. Um, so we've had great. Kate Bush, you know, through Stranger Things. You need yes. an edgy zeitgeist re- re- yes. re- reminding moment, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, I'm thinking as, as you were say- telling this story about Pellington, I wonder what would happen if you just put their name on the ballot once. And see what kind oh, of a groundswell win. of interest. I mean, think about Duran Duran. They deserve to be in, and they got in, thankfully, on their, I think it was their first try. Yeah. But when you just put the name out there, I, you know, every year there's like 30 or 40 names on it before they decide, uh, decide who's going to make it in. Think of, think of, put it in on there and see what happens. Yeah. For, but the thing with Duran Duran, didn't they give an award the year before for Roxy Music? You know what? You're right. I think they inducted Roxy Music and little they did. Uh, little things and like that. Of, seed. You're yeah. right. You're right. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Trent Reznor did it for, uh, might have been Depeche Mode or someone as well, or some of that sort of genre. But you, they need a big cheerleader in the, yes. you know, on the board saying, like, we, this is it should have happened by now. Well, we asked Noel Rogers. Oh, yeah. We asked Noel Rogers, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. asked Noel Rogers yeah. to be our chief leader. <laughs> yeah. we, we got Noel for 30 minutes before he went on stage, and we were able to do the interview in his change room at, here in Melbourne at the Forum Theatre. Real gentleman. Um, probably going, who the fuck are these guys? I know. It was literally one door opened, and then he was just shut <laughs> out again. It was yeah, quite yeah. hilarious. He's probably my <laughs> favourite interviewee of all. Him and Noel Gallagher, I just think, are the two most entertaining and interesting interviewees. Oh, yeah. And I love Niall. He's my third favorite producer ever. I've been trying to get him for years. You were kind enough to kind of help me with this. And they said yeah. maybe at the end of the summer. So assuming yeah. we're still a yeah. podcast at the end of the summer, hopefully I can talk to Niall. Hey, you guys said, but I thought we'd make, make tie it up a little bit and let you indulge a bit about your favorite sort of uh, artist. And that's, uh, I think, Neil Finn. Neil, to the, uh, a greater audiences in Australia, you know, probably uh, for, known for split ends and then equally for Crowded House. Neil... 
as you interestingly touched upon, you know, got into Fleetwood Mac and was able to buy, I think, a house in Los, Los Vilas or whatever there, the end of his Fleetwood Mac tour. He's done so many great things. I know the, the debut album from Proud House is your favourite album. Um, yeah. uh, tell us about your love of Neil and just what he's meant to you over the journey. It was later in life that it occurred to me that the, and when I say later in life, I mean probably, you know, the 90s, college or something like that. When you start making those lists of like, what are my favorite albums of all time? I just realized that the one album that always sounds fresh to me and that I'm not tired of it is the first Crowded House album. I'm always happy to hear it. I just think he's one of the greatest songwriters that's ever lived. I feel like him, people like him and Paul McCartney have melodies coming out of their fingertips 24 seven. You know? And it's like innocent music, though, isn't yeah. it? It's like, it's, you it's think simple. you've heard it already. It's deceptively simple. Yes, exactly, yeah. B. And it, that's, the, that's the part that's amazing to me, kind of going back to what I was saying about In Excess and how it's not that easy to write these great songs. They have a knack to to find these melodies that seem so simple, and yet it, no one else thought of them except those two guys, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so. I don't know that Neil is always the greatest or the deepest lyricist of ever, of all time, but he his music is it's just simple. It hits you every time. And now, having said this, I will say over the years, because since getting into podcasts and discussing music so much with people, I will say it. If I have to be honest about it, I've been less impressed with most of what Neil has put out for probably about the last twenty years. The last two Credit House albums are okay nothing special his side projects the pajama club is pretty good his solo albums are okay so some of the bloom is falling off the rose a little bit but yeah. i still stand by him as one of the greatest there's ever been during lockdown they were doing those they were recreating their albums and, yeah, uh, and they were like behind the scenes story. yes because it was uh, live in an echoey room and it just sounded superb yeah i was hooked i was too and i I know people who know him or have like Jeff after who wrote that book on him kind of connected me with people. So I try to get him on the show uh, to be completely honest. I'm not even sure. I don't have like burning questions to ask him I, other than just, I want him to know I love him. You know, that's it. Yes. I think you, you said something interesting in the interview that probably, you know, Tim's material and his contributions the last 20 years has probably been more inspiring to listen to, yeah. you know, in their careers of maybe inverted in quality senses to, yeah, I was not expecting that. I have always, I has, I hate to admit it, but I've always just paid so much less attention to Tim because of, of, in a battle between the two, not that there is one, it, my heart always went to Neil. But the last few years, I've perked up more and thought what Tim was doing was really strong. And then when I got pitched him to come on the podcast and I'm going back over the newest things and the new projects that he has coming out and they just feel more interesting and more fresh to me yeah. than some of the newer things that Neil has done. I would take him more risk, hasn't he? You know, yes. Filming, and so and I would take, and dish, different things. Yes. I would take Neil's first 20 years and I would take Tim's last 20 years. One of my memories is when I was, it was, um, when, when did, um, take the weather, you, weather came out. Uh, weather with you came out, I believe in 1992, 91, 91, 92. Yes. 91. Okay. So I was on a bus going through a suburb and this big Rasta got on the bus and like massive like this with his with his toke or whatever and he was singing that really? song and it gives me tangles every time because he had this big smile on his face he was as happy as anything yes. and the whole bus you know it was just wonderful and I, oh that's when i hear that song i always yes. hear him. i love that <laughs> i hear you yeah. rastafarian b and i'll trump you with uh with my son little <laughs> will murdoch <laughs> my my son calls that the weather the weather song because that was the song that the bell would go to at school when I drop him off. Oh, it's really? Oh. But, um, you know, you've been a big inspiration for B and I. You've taught me a lot. You know, that has helped me. You know, I guess you know, try and get our little thing sort of out in the marketplace. And for that, I, I thank you for that. Of course, and I'm I'm envious. I remember when I had you mentioned Mark Gable from Choir Boys when he was on, and he years and years ago. This was pretty early on for me, and he mentioned that he was still friends with Kirk Pengilly, and I said think you could give me kirk and he's like oh i don't know the all the nxs guys are completely locked down by these like ndas and law lawyers who won't let them talk it, it has to go through this whole chain of command of getting approved and i was like man this will never happen i'll never get to talk to anyone from nxs and the fact that you guys have carried on for four years talking about nothing but nxs and have everybody in, involved with the band and on the periphery talk to you I am so band. jealous. I know. I am so jealous. <laughs> John, I will I, I will share a little secret here. Um, when we started the podcast here in 
2020, four years. Best of in excess album uh, had been in the charts for the prior five years, six years. First three years of our podcast, it was still in the charts, and it's it's since gone diamond status, which is like eight, nine, ten times platinum. And we would sort of promote its chart status every. I remember, I remember you guys and, saying where it was in the charts. Yeah, that's right, yeah. and it's just sort of been this sort of ever selling sort of juggernaut. And then sometimes you know things come along, they put the show on on streaming services, gets a boost. You know, they might do an appearance on something at a grand final, like Kurt played saxophone at the NRL Rugby League grand final. Big Australian singer called Amy Shark, who's uh, quite a big artist here. And he played the Never Tear Us Apart with there. So some of the charts sort of reboost. But we sort of think management like the fact that there was this dedicated NXS stuff that we're keeping them in the Australian consciousness. We may have helped an Elden sale or two. And I think they turned the, the, their eye the other way. Yes. So we think some of that sort of stuff has been what you might call quick pro quo, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, no, let's I, get so over it, this. It, when Andrew came on, who was the only guy from the band I've been able to talk with, we talked for like an hour and a half. And the first half hour or so was me being nice and talking about his new country album, which is really good. Surprising, but it's good. And then for the last hour, I mean, I just, I vomited love all over him for an hour, you know? Yeah. I, I was even yeah. getting pre- pretty emotional uh, for lots yeah. of it. He yeah. could tell and he would comment on that. Because I just feel so passionately about them. So I'm envious. You guys have a good thing going. Yeah, John, we go over the bit of a tribute song at each at the end of every episode. And uh, we haven't done this very many times, but we'd love to do it for you. We'd like you to pick the, the In Excess song that you would like to uh, have go out as a tribute to you being on today. Uh, there's no pressure in coming up with one. It doesn't have to be your favorite song. It might be one that means something to you. It might be something that means uh, this little podcast. We'd like to give you the, uh, the uh, very rare opportunity to pick a tribute song for you being on today. Well, uh, first of all, that's a huge honor. I, I do. I want to shoehorn one more story. Um, I recently had the engineer and producer Tom Lord Algie on the show, yes. and he worked on Elegantly Wasted. Yes. And he tells a really he was a very forthright and open and honest guy. And he said, you know, if I if I could, I if I were ever to buy Michael Hutchins a gift, it would be a bar of soap because that guy smelled so bad all the time. Which oh, I hate yeah. to say, I know I. I just thought that was really interesting trivia. I don't know. I don't know. Cigarettes, body odor, sex. Who knows what he's up to? But (laughs) apparently he just smelled a lot. So anyway, I thought that was a funny story. You heard it first here. Yes, (laughs) yes. Now, now bring it down a notch just quickly. Unfortunately, Michael couldn't smell at the end of his life. That's true. That's true. (laughs) <laughs> no, that's true. He had no idea what kind of... Yes, what he was smelling like. You know, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go the easy route on this one, guys. My very favorite NXS song is "Disappear." I, I felt bad telling Andrew that because John and Michael wrote that, not Andrew. But it is my favorite one. Yeah. So you're welcome to end with that. Or if you know of a really clever cover that I don't, go ahead and play the cover. But it, "Disappear" is my favorite NXS song. And when is that, is that yourself, what resonates with you? Is it the vocal? The it's the just structure? something about the moodiness at the beginning. Uh, I just feel that kind of darkness a little bit. And then going into the chorus, revving up with the the dichotomy between the moodiness and the high-powered excitement, I feel that. It hits me in both spots, you know, really well. It's the song of theirs that I just never get tired of. We're going to let you introduce, to to avoid copyright issues, we'll let you introduce the Light at Wembley version. Okay. Okay. (laughs) So my favorite song from In Excess is Disappear. And we're going to close it out here with the Live from Wembley version for people to understand and hear that one if they didn't know it already. All right, well, it's a goodbye from me. It's a goodbye from me, John. And it's a goodbye from B.